my name is Bill Gale. I'm the head of the, of the Retirement Security Project here at the Brookings Institution. It's great to see so many people here on a morning uh, when the Mueller report is also being released. Uh, I want to start by thanking Richard Thaler for the excellent uh, presentation. I have learned an enormous amount of economics, psychology, humor, et cetera, from you over the years. And I learned some more this, this morning. Uh, quite honestly, I can't think of anyone else who has changed the way I and we think about retirement saving than, than, uh, than you have. So thank you for today and thank you for all your work. We're all indebted to you. Uh, and uh, as Richard uh, alluded to in the world of annuities and lifetime income, the idea of living to 100 or 110 is, is the bad news that we're trying to protect against. If you ever want an example of why people call economics the dismal science, that's, that's probably uh, one of the best. Um, before we start, I'd also like to thank the Laura and John Arnold Foundation for funding the research that went into this conference and, and the conference itself. Uh, the Arnold Foundation has been a consistent supporter of RSP. Uh, we very much appreciate that, and uh, uh, we hope that uh, it's been worth it uh, from the Arnold perspective as also. All right, uh, before we start, uh, I was trying to uh, summarize the conference yesterday, and I realized it was National Haiku Day. So uh, here's we go. Uh, this is what we focus on, how best to balance consumption and lifespan risk, safe lifetime income. And that's our whole, that's our whole message today. So um, the standard way to provide lifetime income is through an annuity. Uh, as has been mentioned, that can be a social security plan, a defined benefit plan, or through something sold by a life insurance company. But it turns out annuity is not the only way uh, to generate safe lifetime income. And our next session focuses on ways to provide lifetime income that do not involve annuities. You should have bios of everyone uh, so I'll be very short in introducing people. Uh, we'll start with David John, who will present uh, a jointly authored paper on new approaches to lifetime income. Uh, as a co-author of this paper, I can tell you that I am confident that there will be fewer redactions in the paper than in the Mueller report. Uh, David is a senior strategic policy advisor at the AARP Public Policy Institute, and he's a non-resident senior fellow here. David will be followed by Moshe Malewski, who is a professor at the Schulich School of Business at York University in Toronto. Uh, his presentation will focus on tontines, that very mysterious uh, non-pastry item, uh, a subject on which he's one of the world's experts. If you don't know what a tontine is, I'm not going to steal his thunder. Uh, if you waited this long, you can wait another 20 minutes uh, to hear from the expert himself. Uh, our final speaker will be Michael Davis. He's the head of Defined Contribution Plans, I'm sorry, head of Defined Contribution Plan Specialists at T. Rowe Price, and he will offer comments on the topic of lifetime income through Defined Contribution Plans. After that, we'll bring everyone up, we'll ask a few questions, and then we'll have question and answers with, with the audience. Uh, so David, the podium is, is all yours. Well, thanks, Bill. Uh, let's see, just first here, earthquake insurance. Okay, uh, now I'm making, making my plans for the future here. <laughs> All right. As the uh, professor uh, said, converting your uh, retirement savings into lifetime income is one of the most complex financial decisions that an individual has to make in their lifetime. You have a wide variety of unknowns, et cetera, et cetera. Now, periodically, I will go into a, a room and close the door, and I will do an exercise. And I'll say, all right, now, you're going to retire tomorrow at such and such an age. Here's what you've got in assets, et cetera. And now, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to take care of, et cetera? And 
I will also at times have a little jar with slips of paper of unknown uh, or surprise events. You know, you've been diagnosed with an illness, you've just won the lottery, uh, a, a wide variety of other things. And usually after I sit down and I try to work this out, and I do this every day, uh, at least eight hours a day uh, with degrees in finance and economics and I usually end up with a splitting headache and go off for coffee or an early lunch. The simple fact is that this is difficult and most people say precisely the same thing. In a recent survey, as you see, 73% of Americans said they don't have the skills to do this, financial skills. 79% said they don't think their neighbors do either when it comes down to it. Everybody discounts their neighbors. Thing. As the UK's NEST, uh, National Employment Savings Trust, has said, research has shown that even the most financially capable individuals can make irrational and suboptimal choices when it comes to financial matters or defer those, making those choices out of regret aversion. In other words, if it's a hard decision and we don't have to make it immediately, we probably won't. And if we do have to make it immediately, we'll probably botch it. So what we need is, as has been suggested, an automatic retirement income solution that works as well as the many uh, automatic mechanisms available for the saver. This is an impossible to read slide, but it will be in the eventual paper. So uh, this is a survey that the British Nest System did of individuals asking what they want. The top one is basically they want income that grows with inflation. They want protection from uh, investment risk. They also want flexibility, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, they want anything that uh, will give them, as has been said, a stable, easy to understand, consistent retirement income, and in the US context, to supplement their social security benefits. Now, obviously, annuities are a potential solution here. Uh, they offer just about every feature that the uh, consumers want, except for a few problems. They're wildly unpopular. Uh, it, all you have to do basically is to use the word annuity and there actually was at least one study where people described the properties of an annuity and people loved it up until the time that the A word was used and then they hated it uh, at the same time. They're expensive. Uh, they're not flexible. Usually people have the idea that if you make a choice with an annuity, you're stuck with it. And of course, then there's the proverbial, what happens if I walk off a curb and a bus hits me? That Still, it is a solution for certain individuals. Now, this is not a problem that is limited to the United States alone. Virtually every major country that has a retirement savings system, and that's an increasing number in the world, is now focusing on the question of what do we do about converting savings into income? The Australians, there was a tweet yesterday from uh, Jeremy Cooper, who's one of the Australian uh, experts in their superannuation system, pointing out a poll that showed that most Australians have the same worry about running out of money, despite the fact that they are required to save for uh, retirement through this super system. So Australia is looking at something called comprehensive income products for retirement. Clearly a phrase that was not created by a marketing expert in the slightest. But basically they are now in the process of implementing this and all super plans will be required to offer this uh, in roughly 2024 or so. They're going to have the framework passed this year. In the United Kingdom, the House of Commons ha Committee on Work and Pensions has recommended the government uh, implement a similar solution. Uh, the government seems distracted by some minor kerfluffle at the moment but uh, and haven't done anything at this point. But the British Nest System has proposed a rather detailed plan for how to implement an alternative solution. In Canada, we have uh, seven major pension stakeholders calling for uh, longevity risk pooling. And in the most recent budget, the Canadian government has actually proposed to create a tontine, not French pastry. 
last but not least, in New Zealand, uh, they actually have a triennial uh, review of their savings system, the Kiwi Saver. And I just learned this yesterday, too late to put it on the slide, that next week they actually have a conference as part of that triennial review looking at retirement income solutions. So this is not a US problem, this is a global problem. So what do we see in the, the proposals that are out there at the moment? They have several common elements. First off, there is, as an alternative to an annuity, a pooled managed payout fund. And we'll discuss that a little bit further in a moment. They also have a, an additional amount set aside for emergencies or other needs. In other words, something so that the flow of income doesn't depend or be changed if you pull out a little bit of money here and there because either you've got a medical emergency, the car goes bluey at an inconvenient time, or you just want to visit a relative. And last but not least, there is some form of tail risk protection in the form of either a longevity annuity or a self-annuitizing feature, such as something that is not a French pastry. If we look at the managed payout fund, the pools managed payout funds, these actually exist. And uh, they exist in a variety of countries. So for instance, uh, Shell Oil has this kind of a mechanism available for their employees in the Netherlands. It's an actively traded fund with a fairly high proportion of equities so that you get the income that an individual needs, but it also has a significant amount of countercyclical alternative investments to limit any sort of a reduction uh, in the event that the markets go down. As an ex you'll see an example portfolio there that actually is one that uh, exists in one of the retail funds in the US. Uh, as you see, it, in addition to having a fairly significant amount of stocks, there are also a variety of other things and uh, alter investments. The key factor here is that payouts vary. So, in if you look at this particular retail fund in the US, it will set a target amount of income for the year and it will pay that amount in 12 installments throughout the year. If the market has gone down significantly the following year, the payout may be less. If it's gone up, it may be more. But it, because of the alternative investments, the risk is ameliorated to some extent. This long quote from Bonnie Jean MacDonald, one of the experts in Canada, in a recent uh, op-ed in uh, the Globe and Mail, a Canadian newspaper, uh, discusses why you get a better return. It says essentially you get much more than you would achieve on your own, and I'm paraphrasing here, because you have reduced fees, the same kind of reduced fees that you would have seen in a traditional defined benefit uh, plan pool, plus the fact you have a Perf a, a professional organization that is managing this, so you have economies of scale, better asset purchasing power, better opportunity to diversify investments, et cetera, et cetera. This has a real potential to provide retirement income with the flexibility to change your mind. But it's not for everyone. This equally hard to read slide, which also will be in uh, the paper, looks at some of the features that determine which people should pick which solution. On one hand, we have the probability-based people. Probability-based would use this pooled managed payout system. Essentially, they're looking at a lifestyle goal that is their overall lifestyle. They depend on uh, one income area. They want a diversified portfolio with growth so that they can meet this goal. And uh, the investment account will basically be their entire retirement income or a significant part of it. The alternative is the safety first people. And these are the people for whom the annuity is intended. They prioritize their goals, and they want to match the risk level with their priorities. So the first priority is likely to be something like paying housing expense, having food, uh, paying medical expenses, things along that line. They will then choose assets to match those goals, and these people have the feeling that they 
will get one shot at fixing their retirement income, so they better do it the right way. And for that reason, they are much more interested in uh, looking at an annuity or something along that line. And an investment account, if there is one, is going to be basically for luxuries or travel or something along that line. Now, one alternative to the investment account, the pooled investment account, is the non-French pastry tontine. I think I've overused that. <laughs> this is uh, <laughs> an asset pool that plays inv pays investors a regular income. This is a traditional thing. And basically, it's a in most cases, a closed pool, although it doesn't have to. And as investors die off, the proceeds from the investments are divided among fewer and fewer people, so therefore, basically, the investments go up there. In the early 20th century, the tontine was essentially accounted for roughly two-thirds of the life insurance market in the United States. It represented 7% of the national wealth, and roughly half the households in the country had one at that point. They were also, as so much else was in financial world in the early 20th century, grossly abused and uh, to the point that uh, the New York State Legislature banned them in, 2000 and, or, in 1906. Uh, and since then, they've fallen out of favor. However, there are modern tontines that are coming up for retirements. You'll hear firsthand, so I'm not going to go into any detail on this. Uh, the key factor here is that a traditional tontine, in theory, would pay its highest benefits towards the end of life. And this is not the way retirement income actually is spent. People typically will spend more early in life, then it will gradually tail off, and there in the United States, there are higher expenses towards the end of life, uh, typically associated with health care, something none of us really want to talk about. As you'll hear, however, the modern tontine uh, theorists have created mechanisms that would smooth this income out over retire uh, uh, the entire base of their retirement and therefore solve this problem. But I, I'm not going to go into that to any further detail at this point. So what are we proposing, however? What are we going to do to help people uh, come up with the same kind of a decent solution that they would have gotten otherwise? We propose three parts. You, this may sound a little bit familiar from a few minutes ago. A managed payout fund, an emergency fund, and longevity annuity or other form of protection. And this is a package. This is not separate elements. This is something that you would be put into. The managed payout fund is also not part of the target date fund. The use of the target date fund ends upon retirement. An individual could be gradually moved into the managed payout fund at, say, age 55, 58. This is what the uh, fund in the Netherlands does. Or it could be all at once at uh, a time that uh, the individual chooses to retire. The fund would hopefully include many different companies' funds. This is not the matter of the XYZ Corporation Managed Payout Fund. This is a large pool of fund, a uh, pool of money that represents the retirement savings of hopefully hundreds and thousands of people uh, all at once. The transfer is not irreversible. So in the event that the uh, transfer starts at age 55, and at age 58, an individual changes jobs. The money can just be simply rolled out of the managed payout fund and into the new employer's fund. Uh, also, if the individual chooses uh, some alternate course of action, they could uh, take the money out and use it for something else. One of the things I discovered when we were researching this paper, I talked to a variety of colleagues who were retired, and many of them said, gee, I wish I knew now, uh, or I knew then what I know now, because circumstances change, and I needed to have some flexibility to adjust my 
retirement plans for the new realities that pop up every other day or so. The advantage of this fund is that it provides you with that flexibility. You're not locked into a contract. And as a separate fund serving many employers, if you have throughout your career a couple of 401k plans, a couple of IRAs, whether they, you save them on your own or there's something that uh, your previous 401k was rolled over into, you could then move that money into this fund and it would all be treated as your retirement fund, period. It's a way of aggregating uh, your retirement money to come up with a, a decent solution. Last but not least, the retirees would receive a monthly check. That's the American norm. The payments would be structured to meet the required minimum distribution rules, however those are changed or adjusted going in the future. And the fund would be designed so that it could have subdivisions so that it could handle both traditional uh, accounts and uh, Roth uh, after-tax accounts. When you come to the purchase of the longevity annuity, if you have a longevity annuity and you're not using one of the self-annuitizing features here, the, either that could be handled as uh, the QLAC that was developed by the Treasury Department when Mark Ivory was there, in other words, all at once, or you could, as the uh, British Nest System proposed, delay this so that you're accumulating the money over a space of years to purchase that, but the actual purchase doesn't come up until, say, age 75 or 78, with payments beginning at, say, age 85. That way, if circumstances change, read health care problems, uh, you don't necessarily have to spend the money and therefore lose it there. And finally, to help our friends in the industry, uh, this could also be offered as an individual product for individual savers, uh, obviously at a slightly higher fee level. But in other words, this is something that could be available to people of all ages, of all uh, savings uh, vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. We think that this has the potential to make a real difference in the way people look at their retirement solutions because they're not, you don't come in and you sit down with the HR department and they either say, here, we're going to have you a lump of money and if you've been in a perfect solution where you've been in an automatic system all along and you have no experience in managing your money yourself, it's now up to you or you're not locked into a situation where you've made a decision, you're anxious about that decision, and now you're stuck with it regardless of what happens. So this is the beginning of a discussion. This is not a perfect solution. It is an attempt at the first one, the, at m making one. One of the things we want to hear are questions, comments, and answers about what's right and what's wrong with this. So hopefully we will start that process during the uh, Q&A and we can continue it for some time afterwards. And with that, I'm gonna turn the stage over to Prof Professor Malevsky. Thanks. Thank you. It's a pleasure and honor to uh, be here today. Uh, my presentation is entitled From Tontines to Annuities, where you'll finally learn what they really are. Uh, they've actually been in the news quite a bit, and to echo what uh, David was saying, uh, this is a global problem. The issue of how to draw down or to decumulate assets. Can Canada's budget, uh, which is where I'm from in Toronto, uh, proposed about three or four weeks ago a managed payout fund. And I'll just highlight uh, that their requirement is that all you need is 10 members to be part of this uh, managed payout fund. And uh, they're still writing legislation. But uh, the point here is to, again, elaborate the fact that this is a, a global issue, not just a, a local US one. Uh, also, uh, this is a good point to remind you I'm from Canada. So if uh, if things get too partisan here, I'll uh, plead Canadian uh, as, we, uh, as we go forward. 
So this did not start uh, until in, in, in earnest until the 17th century. So this is a bit of a history lesson, and uh, I apologize for the next five or ten minutes. I'm going to take you back to the 17th century, where both the English and the French government uh, are in need of funds to fight wars. They're in fighting wars against each other, obviously. And they both decide to implement this scheme. Uh, what they would do is they would uh, borrow money, uh, from an annuitant or a subscriber, sometimes called an investor, uh, and they would take that money, government would take that money, you have to understand this is the 17th century before long-term government bonds or central banks and so on, and the minimum investment was 100 pounds uh, at the time, uh, late 1690s, 100 pounds would be about 10,000 today, so this was an investment for wealthy people, and they would give that 100 pounds to the government, and the government would in exchange promise to give them interest. Uh, there was one other player in this, besides the investor and the government who takes the money, and that was a nominee, uh, a third party, possibly one of the two, but a third party, and you'll see their role in a minute. And over time, this investor would receive coupons or interest payments. Uh, it would be a dividend, and that dividend would continue. It would be 10 pounds, so think of it as a 10% government bond. You just handed 100 pounds to the government. They're going to give you 10%, but they'd give you a little bit extra. Every year, they'd give you just a little bit extra. Uh, think of it, uh, if I can use a term that some people might be familiar with, an indexed annuity, where they tell you, well, you're going to get 3% plus a little bit more depending on the performance of the market or depending on some spread. It was a similar thing where you'd get a little bit more depending on an event, which I'll describe in a moment, but as long as your nominee was alive. As soon as your nominee, the person you had selected to be the nominee, passed away, those payments would end and you got absolutely nothing. Your bond dies with your nominee. So let me go through a numerical example so that people understand this. These things actually existed. This isn't from an Agatha Christie novel or a Simpsons episode. These were very, very popular instruments that were used to finance government debt, in a sense. So let's imagine that uh, we have 20 people, a syndicate of 20 people, and they each hand over 100 pounds to the government. They have 2,000 pounds. They can go off and fight a war for a couple of months, and they'd all be guaranteed 10% interest. So if at the end of the year, all 10 of these investors, syndicate members, were still alive, they'd get a 10-pound dividend or a 10-pound payment. It's simply the 200 divided by uh, the 20 survivors. Don't overthink this. This is very simple. This is a 10% coupon payment. But now let's imagine, now let's imagine that at the end of the second year, four people pass away. Four people pass away, 16 people are left from the syndicate at the end of the second year. So they all come to a hotel in downtown London, that's how it would work, and the exchequer would wheel in 200 pounds worth of coins and they would distribute it to the 16 survivors. So each one of these 16 survivors would get their share, which is 200 pounds divided by 16, and that would be 12 pounds 50 pence, which is the 10% interest that they were guaranteed, plus the 2.5, which is from the four people that didn't show up. And this was known, at least in modern day actuarial terms, as mortality credits. There was no debate as to why you were getting that. Nobody was sitting in that room in the hotel saying, now why is my annuity paying me only $12.50? It was very clear, 200 in the numerator, we have 16 in the denominator, this is what your payment is going to be. Now let's walk this process through, see very clearly what happens as the pool declines. So let's imagine that we are now at year 20 or 30 and we have, we got a problem here with the, well, let's imagine that we have four people left. Uh, these four people would all be receiving 50 pounds. You'll have to do it in your head. The graphic isn't working. If we have four people that are in the denominator uh, and we have 200 pounds in the numerator, uh, we're going to have each person walking away with 50 pounds because that's the amount that's going to be distributed. So where's that 50 pounds coming from? It's 10 pounds interest and it's 40 pounds what we call mortality credit. Now let's think about this for a moment. Are you sitting there in the year 1720 and saying, gee, those 50 pounds that I'm getting from the tontine, I shouldn't have locked in that thing in 1693. You know, the Fed was about to tighten interest rates. I would have waited a year. I would have gotten at least 1% more on my tontine, 11%. 
the majority of the 50 pounds that you're getting is these mortality credits. Interest rates become less and less important later on. You're not sitting there with regret and worrying that you tightened it or that you uh, locked this in at the time of a bad interest rate. Now let's go to the very, very end. Let's imagine that we have that winner at the very, very end, uh, and she's hired Hitman to knock off those three people. Anyway, she gets a 200-pound annuity for life. By the way, this never happened. These were dukes and earls and barons. They didn't kill each other for money. They did it for honor and respect. But this is how <laughs> this is how this taunting works. Okay. Now, some of you might be wondering, where did the, the where did the principal go, Moshe? We handed 100 pounds to the government. Where did the principal go? It's gone. It's gone, and if you want to think about it, it's not that somebody's keeping it, it's amortized so that this is part of the 10% dividend that you're getting. You can think of it in terms of zero coupon bonds. We have a portfolio of strips, there's nothing left at the very end, and that's how this works. Now, what does the payout structure of this Lorenzo Tontin look like? Lorenzo is the name of the person that's associated with it. Lorenzo Tonti in 1650 proposes it to Cardinal Mazarin in, French, in, in France. Uh, he did not invent it, I think there's something called the Stigler law of eponymity. Anybody that's named for something is not the person that invented it. And in his case, it wasn't him. It goes back hundreds of years. But this is what the structure looks like. And I think David alluded to this earlier. And this is a problem. It's not very optimal. Early on, you're getting your 10% or whatever the interest rate is. But as people are dying off and we have less and less people in the denominator, we're getting larger and larger payments. Now, we don't know exactly what you're going to get if you survive to 90. It depends on everybody else in the pool. If everybody else in the hotel survives, you're going to get less. If there are less survivors, you get more. So there's this band of uncertainty over time. But that's the payout structure. And we look at this today and we say, so only if you're 99, you're going to get big payouts. The winner is a centenarian. That's obviously not a very optimal structure. So let's compare life annuities and tontines to make sure we understand the difference between them. In a life annuity, let's start at the right, as people die, the total paid out to the group declines over time. In a life annuity, if you're an actuary for the insurance company and more people are passing away than what you expected, you say, oh, that's great. We don't have to pay this group of people as much because we will have less to pay out. Uh, on the flip side, the payments are going to stay relatively constant uh, to the people that have purchased them. You buy an annuity that's paying you $1,000 a month, you get $1,000 a month for the rest of your life. Right? That's on the annuity side. On the tontine side, the total interest paid each year to the group is known in advance. King William III would send 200 pounds every year to downtown London, and he would say, you figure it out how to split it. We don't want longevity risk on our government books. Here's 200 pounds. You work it out amongst yourselves. You all figure out a way to live a long time. You're going to get less payments. Less people survive. You get bigger payments. We don't have longevity risk on our books. On the flip side, though, the payments to the survivors are going to increase because as people die off, you're getting larger payments. You saw the picture before. Now, the first or one of the greatest economists, Adam Smith, was actually a fan of these things. He was writing in the 18th century, and he was debating in the Wealth of Nations whether governments should borrow with annuities, which were quite popular, or with tontines. Should governments borrow and promise you a fixed payment for the rest of your life? Or should governments say, look, here's the money for the syndicate, you spread it. And he said, you know what, people tend to think that they're healthier than everyone else. You know, the Lake Wobegon effect. So what you want to do is you want to sell tontines. You can get away with doing it for less. In fact, uh, I learned about the Hamilton Project here, so I thought I'd have to mention this. Alexander Hamilton was a very big fan of these things, and one of his suggestions uh, was to settle Revolutionary War debt by combining these and creating a tontine. Congress didn't like the idea. They felt it was too British. It was very politically sensitive at the time. But these were extremely popular interests, part of the discourse and part of the debate about whether or not we should finance it with tontines or finance it with annuities. So we now get to the audience participation part. And uh, with Professor Taylor in the audience, I'm extremely nervous now. But here, here's the way uh, I would like to do this. I would like you to imagine that you are about to retire from a 401k, 403b plan, and your plan sponsor gives you two options and two options only. Two options only. You can get a 14% life annuity. What does that mean? For every $100,000, they're going to give you $14,000 a year for the rest of your life. You have 100000 in the account, you're going to get $14,000 per year, nominal terms for the rest of your life, you. Or you could select the Tontine, which pays $8,000 initially. Why would you take the 8000 if you can take the fourteen? 
Well, because you're looking around and you're saying that payment's going to increase over time. And in about seven to ten years, if other people pass away, you're going to get more and more. And who knows, if you survive to the very, very end, you're going to be getting hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I'd like you to take this seriously for a moment, think about it, and with a show of hands, you've got 100000 in your retirement account, would you say, I'm going to go with the annuity that pays me $14,000 a year forever, or do you go with the taunting, take the haircut early on of 8000 but you know that that thing's increasing? Show of hands, who would say, you know what, give me the 14% annuity? Show of hands. All right, interesting. Who would say, no, 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 I'll take the tontine. I'll take the tontine. All right. And why is nobody yelling diversify Moshe? Maybe some of it. Yeah. So here's where it gets interesting. If you had more than 60 seconds to think about it, you would take a look around you to see who else is in the pool. Who else is in the syndicate? Oh, no, no, he gets up at 4 a.m. to jog. There's no way I'm getting in a pool with him. Right? You'd want to know something about who the syndicate is. You'd want to know what the credit rating is of the entity guaranteeing the 14%. Yeah, that's really nice. You're promising me 20% for life, but you're a triple C. You're not going to be around for 10 years, let alone my life. Credit rating. That's going to be, you might skew towards the tontine because you say, well, at least there's no risk because the entity is just has to pay the fixed amount. I don't have to worry about longevity risk. Risk aversion and consumption preferences. Some people might say, my preference isn't to have an increasing stream towards the end of my life. I want to enjoy it earlier. So yeah, I like the idea of the tontine, but I don't want to have to wait till 100 to get the money I want it now. So I'm going to take the annuity. It pays me more. Consumption preferences, intertemporal elasticity of substitution is what an economist would call it. Pricing in the term structure of interest rates. If you're a quant, you sit and say, wait a minute, Moshe, is 8% and 14% a fair trade-off? I can't do this in my head. Let me compute the present value of the payments maybe the 8% is better. Long-term inflation expectations. Some of you might say, hey, I like the idea of increasing nominal payments because it's an inflation hedge. It's this inflation hedge that involves nominal bonds. It's inflation that's coming from demographics, from mortality. And I live in a country where we really worry about the long term, so the Tontine's payment would be preferable. So these would all be decisions people would have to make. But the idea is that at least now you understand what an annuity is because you understand the extreme version, which is the Tontine. It's actually very interesting when you take a look at some data that I have access to on what annuities people buy. There's an annuity puzzle, and very few people choose to actively purchase income annuities. But when you look at their purchases, there are three major types. One is a life-only annuity, where people say, I want the most income I possibly can get for the rest of my life, and I don't want guarantees or death benefits or anything. That's known as a life-only. There's life with a guarantee period. Many of you will know this, where you can say, I want the next 10 years of payments, even if I'm dead. It'll go to the kids. It'll go to my spouse. And there's a third type, with this, which is a cash or installment refund. What that means is, look, I'm going to buy the annuity, but if I pass away early, what I want is to get the money back so that the family gets some of it. You only gave me back 50000 I gave you 100000 a few years ago. Give the 50000 back. Can anybody please guess, 2011, 2019, which is the most popular type amongst the 10 billion or so of SPIAs that people purchase? Do they like the one that economists would advocate? Okay, take pure longevity insurance, take the life only. Do they say, no, I want to guarantee just in case something happens in 5, 10, 15 years? Or do they say, hey, I want my money back. I want my money back at death. Any guesses which is the most popular? In 2011, we had 25% of people selecting what we would call the life only, what uh, Menachem Ya'ari would have called pure actuarial notes. He's the person that put mortality credits and longevity insurance into the life cycle model. 25%. In uh, 2011, we have 56% selecting life with guarantee, and cash installment refund is 18%. Front forward to 2019, we have the majority of people saying, no, 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 give me the cash or installment refund. So in some sense, even those that are purchasing SPIAs, we look at those 8 to 10 billion and say, well, you know, it's not that bad. Most of them are watering down the mortality credits by saying, look, I want to get my money back at death because of the fact that I want to know that at least this money is going to be protected. Only 14% are selecting the life only. So I would say the annuity puzzle is even greater uh, than uh, what you think it is. While I show you some data, and I believe I have about seven more minutes, 
The same data also tells me how many people select an annuity with inflation protection. In 2011, 96% said, I'm not interested in a CPIU-linked annuity. Uh, in, 90, in 2019, it's 97%. Only about 3% even ask for uh, a COLA. COLA, just a nominal COLA. And the CPIU, nobody asks for it anymore. So I, I think only economists buy real annuities. The public out there says, I want a nominal annuity. So... Let me get back to the history and wrap this up. This choice that I gave the audience, taunting or annuity, taunt, is not hypothetical. It was actually available to all investors a couple of hundred years ago. The 1693 taunting that I mentioned to you with the syndicate and the 100 pounds gave people an option. So William III, Mary II, King and Queen of England, they're fighting Louis XIV. They both need money. There's an act that's passed in Parliament in 1693 called the Million Act to finance the war with France. They needed a million pounds, and people were given the exact same choice I gave the audience here. They were told, you can give us 100 pounds, and we will give you 14% for the rest of your life as long as you live, 1693. Or we will sell you a tontine, and the tontine will pay 10%. The numerator will be 10%. The syndicate will get 10% for seven years. And then afterwards, in the year 1700, they're going to reduce the payment to 7%. 10% initially, 7% later. And that picture shows you how it would work. So you get 14% if you want the annuity. And if you select the tontine, it's initially high, but it's going to be reduced. And for those of you that are looking at this and wondering, now that's a weird way to design it. Why would they give you more early on and then less later? And the answer is, is that they were starting to think about optimizing the taunting structure. They were saying early on where there's a lot of survivors, we have a large denominator, so we have to have a large numerator. But later on, as people start to die off, we have a smaller denominator, we can have a smaller numerator. They were trying to levelize the expected cash flows. They were looking at the picture that you saw earlier and saying, that's not very optimal. I don't want to get tons of money later on. So they would front load it. And this is the idea that I'd like to take going forward. In fact, uh, there's documents available in the National Archives in the UK. It's fascinating where you can actually go and see the names of people that selected the tontine and the names of the people that selected the annuity. And much like this audience here, no name appears in both lists. Some people said, hey, I'm going with the tontine. And some people said, hey, I'm going with the annuity. And there was, in my examination, there's very little, if any, diversification. And if you actually write down a model and you say, well, you know, you're trying to optimize something, do you diversify? Because it comes down to your views on longevity, it's very difficult to come up with an equilibrium where, no, you put 60% tontine, 60 or 40% annuity. But it's actually quite, quite interesting. I, I found that whole experience uh, fascinating. Yes, the data comes to us. Uh, yeah, they, they opened up their archives to me. I was there for a couple of months. They were really nice. And I asked them, you know, how do I thank you? You know, you don't pay. You just show up there. And they said, well, anytime you talk about this or you show the documents, please thank us uh, at the National Archives. And that's how you show your, your support. So that's what I'm doing with this slide uh, right over here. In fact, I'll, I'll go even one step further. That's me in front of the National Archives uh, there. And uh, just to round this up, uh, that's some of the old Tontine documents. And... Uh, <laughs> And they were yelling at me. I touched it without gloves, so I had to, you know, put on the gloves. So what does the optimal structure look like? What does the optimal structure look like? So, you know, I, I would say that if we were to design one of these, uh, the, you know, you have to think about whether you want to have mortality guarantee or not mortality guarantee. So there's sort of a typography of tontine versus annuity. So let's take a look at this. We have bonds and we have stocks. There's no reason that the numerator has to be coupons from a bond. This can be dividends from corporate stock, bonds and stocks. You can have mortality guaranteed where the insurance company says, look, we'll promise you the 14% forever, but we need capital and reserves and this is going to be costly, or you can have mortality not guaranteed. In the upper right-hand corner, I have the tontine. So it's purely bonds, very long duration, and mortality is not guaranteed. Nothing's guaranteed. Systematic mortality, you're absorbing in the pool. As we move down, uh, the fixed immediate annuity, otherwise known as the single premium income annuity, would also be bond-based. It has shorter duration because the cash flows are earlier on, uh, but the mortality is guaranteed, and you pay for the guarantee. You want 14% for the rest of your life, somebody's got to set aside capital and reserves, and that's going to be costly. Then you have something called the natural tontine, which gets to the design that I alluded to earlier, the 17th century design where they're trying to levelize payments. 
where they say, well, early on, we'll have large payments and we'll have the payments decline in the numerator so that on average we're expecting a flatter payment structure. That would be a natural tontine. You have in Australia and others group self-annuitization schemes, the pooled schemes, which can be bond-based, but it can also be equity-based, so you can have a mixture of instruments where mortality isn't necessarily guaranteed, but it's smooth. It's not at the end of every year we count survivors. It's at the end of every few years we count survivors. And we take a bit of credits from last year, and we use it for this year. They're smoothing. It looks like something is guaranteed, but they're smoothing it over long periods of time, which is why I put it well under the Tontine structure. You have pooled annuity funds where they would say, look, immediately every year what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the survivors, and we're going to give dividends on the S&P 500 index to the survivors. You have variable immediate annuities where, well, they are guaranteeing you in some sense a mortality table, it's equity based. But the point of this picture is to get people thinking that when you're buying an instrument that pays you for the rest of your life, there are two ways to do it. You can do it where somebody guarantees an amount for the rest of your life, a mortality basis for the rest of your life. And there's one when, look, you're going to get it for the rest of your life, but everybody in that pool is going to share it with you. And if they all live a long time, you're going to get less and vice versa in the other direction. That's one dimension. And the other dimension is bonds versus stocks. You know, why are we doing it fixed income? We could do it equity. I would start simply with fixed income first and then move to equity. But those are the two dimensions. And when we talk about, when we talk about pooled solutions and non-pooled solutions and mortality credits and, and annuities and payouts, I think it's important to have this picture in our head so that we say, all right, are you guaranteeing me something? Are we not guaranteeing? Is it being smooth? So that's the picture that I'd like to leave, uh, leave you with. So conclusion, uh, final thoughts. I think tontine thinking is more important than tontine structure. You know, I'm, I'm not here to sell a particular structure. The payout should increase or decline, real or nominal. It's just about thinking that mortality credits are an asset class. And those asset classes, that can be shared. I, you know, to use the language of invest, it's an alpha. It's an alpha. It's orthogonal to everything else. You're going to you're, you're get hundreds of basis points more because of the fact that you were willing to put money in the pool. And some people say, I don't want to put money in the pool. I want it to go to the kids and family. Fine. You're not interested in that alpha for whatever reason. But the idea is to think about that as something that's available to share and stop mixing up the annuity with the mortality credits. There are two things we like about annuities. Smooth, predictable income that's going to be there forever as we get older and we can't can't manage our investments, and then there's mortality credits. You may not like mortality credits and the pooling and you think of adverse selection concerns and how much am I getting. Okay, but the idea of a smooth income, I think that that makes sense independently of whether you like the pooling concept. I think it's also important to remind people that insurance companies charge for absorbing longevity risk. You know, there's a myth, especially when you're teaching sort of finance or economics 101, that a great example of diversifiable risk is mortality, because if you put enough people in a pool, the law of large numbers says that it goes to zero. Not if you have systematic mortality risk. I mean, that is going to affect everybody in the pool. The law of large numbers is going to break down, and insurance companies have to charge for that. In fact, they charge for both ways, on the longevity side and on the mortality side. On both sides, they charge for it. And the question is, do you want to pay for something like that? Do you really need protection against systematic uh, longevity risk? Or do you say, you know, I have Social Security, I have other sources of income, I don't mind, I'm willing to absorb that on my personal balance sheet. Because it's an expensive thing to insure against, systematic longevity risk. You may not be interested in doing that, in which case the taunting would be better for you. Uh, I personally would say that we should offer a portfolio choice between sharing systematic longevity risk with others and transferring it to an insurance company. And I think that's the way it should be positioned. Do you want to absorb it on your balance sheet? Do you want to take it on the balance sheet of the corporation? Or do you want the syndicate? So think of it as a triangle. Insurance company guarantees it, syndicate absorbs it, you take it on yourself on your personal balance sheet. My last and final comment is, I think that when we talk about retirement planning and we're all concerned nobody's buying the annuity, explain the tontine first. Explain how it works historically, very easy to understand. Numerator is the fixed amount, denominator shrinks. And if people recoil and say, oh my goodness, what a horrible way to design something, I'm going to live a long time. But then say, well, there's something, there's something that's tamer, and that's called an annuity. And the insurance company guarantees it. And you don't have to worry about people knocking each other off. And the predictable shrink. Ah, oh, that's available too. Okay, yeah, maybe sign me up. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good morning. 
How's everybody? Fabulous. Um, my name is Michael Davis. I am uh, more than honored to be here. Uh, I see a lot of people that I've known a long time. And as I always say, I don't say old friends anymore. We say friends of long standing. Uh, people at a certain age, they only hear the old part. Um, so really happy to be here. Um, and to address a topic that we just think is so very important, uh, retirement income. Um, I'm happy to be a discussant for the paper, uh, the paper entitled From uh, Saving to Spending, uh, written by individuals that I hold in very high regard, not only for their decades of leadership and retirement thought, but for the people that they are. So thank you for all that you're doing. Also happy to be here with Phyllis Borzy. So people may or may not know that I was Phyllis's deputy in the administration for four years. Uh, she was assistant secretary uh, of EPSA, the Employee Benefit Security Administration in the DOL. She has done tons around retirement and health benefit security. I want to thank you for everything you've done, Phyllis. Great to have you here. Um, so it's also great just to be able to represent the professionals at T. Rowe Price. Uh, DC assets are about half of the total assets we have at the firm. Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about it, and a number of people are here who do that work. So I want to thank them for what they do and the passion they bring to these discussions. Uh, so retirement income, as I said, has become a central tenet of a lot of these broad retirement discussions, and they're becoming a lot more central to what we think about uh, at the firm. Uh, so the statement here is sort of a central tenet of what we are talking about at the firm around retirement income, um, and it's certainly reflected in this paper. Uh, what the paper talks about is that uh, while annuities can certainly provide a meaningful role, uh, there are certainly a wider variety of retirement delivery vehicles uh, that should be considered as well. We would agree with that. Uh, a lot of people on the agenda so far has, have talked about the importance of choice. Um, this principle, as I said, is in concert with our research and our conclusion that given the documented heterogeneity in retirement spending profiles and needs, uh, Americans should have the right to choose how they want to receive lifetime income. And this declaration that's on this page before you uh, was developed by the leaders of our retirement practices across the firm and reflects our thinking and it's based on research uh, uh, for years uh, that people really want choice. And the profiles that they present going into retirement are quite separate and distinct, and they need and deserve options to be able to uh, address those very, very different needs. So any one-size-fits-all sort of retirement income solution that does not honor those distinctive needs, we would say is suboptimal. So in this paper, we celebrate the variety of solutions uh, that the writers have proposed to address differing retirement needs. Uh, the paper posits a variety of solutions, including bond, bond ladders, annuities, redesigned time teams, as we've talked about, uh, and managed payout funds, among others. And we're delighted to see this discussion that speaks to the range of retiree needs and alternatives that should be developed uh, to address them. So why should employers care at all about retirement uh, delivery anyway? Um, it's a key question. Uh, years ago, uh, plan sponsors were not as excited about keeping assets in plan post-retirement. Uh, they viewed them as um, you know, additional costs that were involved, uh, additional exposures that would be um, realized. But we have seen an evolution with respect to plan sponsor thought, and we've also seen an evolution with respect to participant inclinations. Uh, so what this chart shows on the left is um, uh, <laughs> participant activity and their uh, propensity to stay in plan post-retirement. So what you see with respect to the, I don't know if there's a pointer here, but uh, okay, so what you see with respect to the colored bars is uh, 2016, 17, and 18, the increased proportion of uh, plan assets that participants are keeping in plan post-retirement. Uh, it's a significant signal. Again, this is proprietary data from T. Rowe Price's record-keeping operation. Obviously, a limited pool of data, but it also is reflected in broader data from the University of Michigan's HRS study, where you see from 2012, the gray bar on the left, 2016, the blue bar on the right, again, increased proportion of assets that are being kept in plan post-retirement. That is a significant evolution. Uh, we think there are a variety of reasons that might be driving it. Uh, some of it could be increased attention to the value of fiduciary oversight. Thanks, Phyllis. Uh, the conversations around fiduciary rule we think may be having an impact. Um, 
as well as just an interest by plan sponsors to main scale, drive plan costs down by keeping more assets in the plan, uh, we're certainly seeing a big change in behavior, as I, I've said. We're also seeing different preferences with respect to plan sponsors themselves. So this, again, is proprietary uh, research uh, that the firm did. It was led by our VC uh, strategist, Lori Latham, who's here with us today. Uh, what you see on the left is preferences that we found among larger employers. Uh, the bar on the far right uh, is 50%. That is, half of those respondents said that they would prefer to keep assets in plan post-retirement. That is a significant shift. So if you had asked this same question maybe 10 years ago, you likely would not have seen that same percentage. The other big bar you see there, 38.6, is those who have expressed no preference. We think over time, as these conversations continue around retirement income, that bar will certainly go down. On the left, you see uh, data among smaller employers as defined by those with less than 500 million in total assets. Uh, in this case, the um, result is a little bit more muted. About 30% of those plan sponsors say that they would prefer to keep assets in plan post-retirement, but still, we think that's a very, very strong signal and very indicative of where plan, sponsors, uh, plan sponsor thought is going. So there is a differing profile of participants in these plans uh, as far as uh, their replacement with respect to Social Security benefits. So given this increased um, inclination for assets uh, to stay in plan, the profiles of those retirees become a more important area of focus. So as we said earlier, there's a great heterogeneity in retiree profiles uh, exhibited in several ways, uh, as on this chart by their reliance on Social Security benefits. Some have argued that because of Social Security, retirees are effectively over-annuitized, but we find that this is more a function of their level of earnings. Uh, this is Social Security data, and it illustrates the replacement percentage that Social Security benefits will provide at a targeted pre-retirement income replacement rate of 75%. So for very low earners, the bar on the far left, um, it suggests that uh, it will provide, Social Security will, enough uh, income to hit the 75% replacement rate. Installment income from Social Security for these earners can do a good job of meeting their basic needs. But uh, for the great many uh, within this group who have not been able to afford accumulated retirement savings, uh, the challenge is to be able to meet unexpected spending needs in retirement. For higher earners and those represented on the far right, uh, Social Security benefits will replace much less income on a relative basis, yet they are much more likely to have been able to accumulate greater retirement savings. However, they have to have the tools and ability to be able to access um, sort of advice that will be able to help them in retirement. And I'm sure my good friend Kelly Hewler will talk a lot about those tools when she comes up to the stage. But this profile is very indicative of the breadth of retiree profiles and suggests that a single solve for these disparate needs is not the right way to go. Uh, so diverse and flexible solutions may be key to both adoption and ultimate uh, utility across the spectrum of retirees. But this is just one lens through which to see uh, heterogeneity. Other firms such as J.P. Morgan and others have done interesting research on these retiree spending patterns and the difference among them and suggest the need for differing solutions to address the needs. So plan sponsors are really at the fulcrum of retirement benefit delivery and trying to match these participant journeys with preference and products that can address them is not uh, an, in, uh, an insignificant task. Uh, there are a variety of objectives and preference preferences that need to be solved for, as shown on this page, from liquidity to inflation protection, uh, and just a, a range of demographic issues that need to be considered. And this is where optionality, we think, is really, really, really important. As mentioned, there are a variety of solutions available to address uh, the disparate preferences that are resident in any one plan. Uh, these solutions can range in breadth, purpose, and complexity, and include such strategies as systematic withdrawals, bond ladders, deferred and immediate, uh, immediate annuities. Uh, we talked about tontines already, and uh, man managed payout funds. So the bulk of the firm's TRO prices focus has been on the latter with the managed payout funds. Uh, we spent a lot of innovative attention uh, in this area. Um, and we are going to launch a retirement 2020 income fund, in fact, this year. Uh, the way that fund will work is it will provide a 5% 
annualized rate payable monthly to fund participants uh, based on the 60-month trailing net asset value average of those participants in the fund. Now, David talked about not having this be part of a target date. This is a target date, but it wouldn't be necessarily the QDIA. They would have to re-elect closer to retirement within five years of retirement into it. We think that's a better way to do it. You don't want to have the one-size-fits-all as a QDIA that would have to elect affirmatively to go into the fund. The fund wouldn't even show up for other investors that aren't close to retirement. Uh, so it's a way that we have thought uh, to sort of operationalize this. Uh, because of all the operational issues that have to be considered, it's only going to be available to clients on our record-keeping platform for now. Uh, and we plan to launch it this year, probably in, in June. But we know we're not alone in this pursuit, and there are many, many others that are pursuing similar strategies. So we thought the paper was very provocative. It was great reading. Uh, we all enjoyed it. I think it provoked a number of questions that we would want to posit and have people think about. Uh, one is, what, are, uh, what about future generations of uh, retirees? So if you think about the current generation of retirees, uh, they still have, for the most part, access to de defined benefit annuity payments. But if you think about millennials, they're probably not going to have that. So what does that mean with respect to their profile of preferences for retirement income, and how different could they be? Another big question, we've talked a lot about tontines, and having been a former regulator, the question becomes, how will they be regulated? <laughs> Who will regulate them? How will they be regulated? How will they be treated by ERISA and other uh, uh, regulatory schemes? But obviously, I'm sure that's something we will talk about a little bit later in the presentation. So thanks so much for your time. I look forward to talking with you later. upside down here. All right. Uh, I want to thank the discussion, the David and, and our discussants for that interesting discussion. I want to ask, start with a question for each of you, and then we'll turn it to the audience. Uh, David, actually, two questions for you. Uh, one is, do you have anything you'd like to say in response to the two comments? And second, you mentioned in the uh, pooled investment that the returns would be variable depending on actual market returns. Uh, how much could the pooled investment uh, uh, stabilize returns? For example, if we had a situation like 2007 to 2009, how much, would re how much of a hit would current retirees have to take? Let's see. This is on, right? Good. <laughs> uh, first off, I I'd like to thank both discussants. Uh, I actually don't have anything to add there. I would just one point to add is that in the scheme that uh, – the European uh, version of the word for fund, uh, that Shell employees have, most of them actually at retirement choose to have the managed payout fund instead of an annuity. So even with a period of volatility or some volatility, they still choose to have that option rather than to lock themselves into an immediate annuity. Uh, as far as the up and down, it obviously market conditions, a, a total market collapse is going to cause a, a serious problem. I did see some studies as we were looking at uh, some of the research here that suggested with some of the stop gaps that uh, volatility could be a uh, maximum of, say, 10% of payout. So in other words, if you received $100 in uh, a normal year, uh, it might go down to 90 or something along that line. Obviously, the realities would be different and would depend on the circumstances. Moshe, thank you for that great uh, presentation uh, on a topic that I think we all need some, needed some fundamental information about. Uh, one question I, I found myself thinking about was David proposed uh, an automatic retirement structure in his paper. Your, paper, your presentation sort of goes the other way. It says, look, it's more complicated. You've got this annuity versus a tontine. Do you, do you see any useful, you know, any way or any useful way for choice architecture or defaults to enter into the, the discussion about tontines? You know, the word choice architecture is a very uh, 
sacred word, so I'll, I'll be careful with uh, u- using that. I'm, I'm looking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's, let me note two things. I think the word annuity is a meaningless word. It's like saying the word fund. Do you like funds? Do you like funds? Equity, stock, bond, mutual, ETF, venture capital. It's a meaningless word. I think the word annuity has reached that point. You could have an indexed annuity with no living benefit that has nothing to do with lifetime income. You can have a fixed annuity. You can have a VA that has no... So I think we have to be careful when we say default someone into an annuity or uh, nudge people into an annuity. Do you mean the historical annuity where we have pooling and mortality credits? I can't get out then. I, 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 can't, I shouldn't be allowed to get out because if I get sick, I'll say I want my money back, and that's anti-selection, and, and the pool falls apart. So it's, it's very, very different than defaulting people into a mutual fund or a target date fund or a life cycle fund where, look, you know, 90% of people don't pay attention, but if you are and you're not happy, you can change your mind tomorrow, it's liquid. You can't do that with these things because you break the pooling. So when you say would you recommend or advocate or create a choice where people are defaulted into one of these things, you're not going to be able to do it into an annuity because of the fact, what we would call it, what an economist would call an annuity, because then they can't get out. And if you say, no, 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 they'll be able to get out, well, you can call it annuity, but it isn't anymore. There's no mortality pooling. So maybe there's a a, a path where you're getting warnings. Warnings, six years from now, you're annuitized. Warning, three years from now, you're annuitized. Red envelope, you are annuitized today. You can't get out, and we gave you six years of warning. Maybe that's the way to do this as opposed to say everybody would get defaulted into or a percentage defaulted into that's part of the confusion over what does the word annuity mean, I'm afraid. You know, when somebody gets up and says, I hate annuities. I hate them. What annuity are you talking about exactly? Well, you know, the expensive kinds with high surrender charges and high fees. And then you describe to them the old instrument that's been around for 3,000 years that people used well before pensions. Retire, you're getting, oh, no, that's great. I love that thing. But I hate the, well, but that's, an, that's what it used to be. So anyway, I'm going on and on here, but I hope you get the point. I, I, I not only get the point, I hope everyone else did, but uh, David, Mark, and I, with, along with a woman named Lena Walker, wrote a paper about a decade ago uh, that talked about that sort of two-year warning, three-year warning. The idea was to put people into a monthly payment for two years and then at, as a default, and then if they, the, at the end of two years, they could either default into another two years or they could choose to annuitize or they could choose to cash out. Maybe that's where I got the idea. Sorry. Maybe I, so. I, I, I know I read it somewhere. It's never original, but I guess that's where I read it. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, Michael, you stressed the emphasis, you, you stressed the importance of giving people lots of choices, lots of options. That sort of runs opposite to the automatic approach. Uh, just can you comment on how, how you're thinking about that? Well, we're thinking primarily of employer sponsored plans and the default. And the the problem is if you embed something in in the default, you're solving a single problem that may not be the same for each of those individual participants. Uh, So what we would say is you have to have some kind of, I don't want to use the word choice architecture, although I love nudge. Uh, I know it's it's a protected term. But but, but he's really right about it because we just think that uh, if you look at the different profiles of the individuals in any typical plan, their needs in retirement are so disparate that if you try to solve them with one product, it's probably not the right way to go. So there's got to be an architecture that enables people to have choice. It could be delivered through managed account. It could be delivered through out-of-plan options. But at the end of the day, there's got to be a mechanism to solve the disparate needs that people have on the way out. It's a much more complex problem. All right, great, thank you. Uh, Let's turn to the the questions uh, right here. Victoria Feinberg, retiree from the Department of Defense, and they will use another sacred word, which is acronym by Danny Kahneman, what you see is all there is. And I'm afraid that both uh, the economists and the public only see or believe that only what they see is all there is. Case in point, uh, I would love to get inflation indexed annuity. I don't worry that tomorrow I will fall under a bus. What I worry about is that my, my insurance company will run into this uh, 
island protected uh, from extradition. But uh, even worse so, today I think it's only one or two companies that offer inflation indexed annuities in the United States. And one, thank you, Bob. By the way, Bob knows more about it than I do, but my, my point is that uh, the series are excellent. But in practice, as a retiree with assets, I just don't see a practical way to inf in invest into the inflation index annuity. And Tantins and other schemes have this uh, problem of uh, running away from me. I'm wondering if I could take that. There are three or four comments I want to make. First of all, you, you can buy inflation index funds, inflation index bonds. I presume you're not going to annuitize 100%. Why does the annuity have to be the thing that's inflation indexed? If what you want is inflation protection, there are other assets. They're much cheaper, the reserve requirements. If you tell me I've annuitized 100%, because I believe, you know, everybody should annuitize 100%, then, yeah, you've got to. But other, uh, that's, that's number one. Yeah. The, the other point I want to make, and this to this misconception, well, you know, if everybody, if we develop a cure for cancer, God willing, uh, insurance companies are going to go bust. I mean, you understand that they're selling two things. They're selling annuities and they're selling life insurance. So you're in the, their annuity business might show a loss because mortality has declined, but if mortality declines, their life insurance business is going to do very well. They have to pay out when people die, and if people aren't dying, they don't have to pay out. So good insurance companies manage that. They hedge that, and they actually sell. You know, they'll say, well, we have a hole in the seven-year bucket. We need to sell some longevity insurance to balance it out. So this idea that they're all going to get into trouble – Pension funds will get into trouble because they don't have a balanced book. They don't sell life insurance and, and, uh, and annuities, so it's, it's going to be. Uh, but the final point, and really gets to the essence, when people are asked, do you want a real annuity on the screen? You know, 200,000 people quote annuities on an a annual basis, and you have a choice. Do you want real or nominal? 99.9%, .9 no, 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 give me the nominal. As soon as they learn that the real one's going to give them a big haircut up front. So you might want one. I'm an economist. I might want one. We're a very small group. I remember being at a meeting of the American Economics Association with Jeff Brown and with Mike Orzak, and we were talking about designing the ideal annuity. So first of all, we want some flexibility because we don't want mortality risk entirely absorbed by the company. We wanted real payments. We wanted a bumper at the end because of health care, and we designed this brilliant annuity, and Jeff said to me, and there's only seven people who will ever buy it, and we're all in the room right over here. <laughs> Josh Kotpem, also of Brookings. David, I, one question that Moshe just adverted to, which I think is worth your talking a little more about, is how might this architecture become something that is chosen? In other words, we are in a market for retirement products. Are you assuming that this is something that employers would choose as a preferred approach, as in effect the default on the default, or are you, are you arguing that this would come into the market in full competition in Michael's split? How, how, does this, how does this survive the Moshe only seven people understand it and only three people will buy it? Well, first off, once again, this is not an annuity product. This is a managed payout fund with an annuity at the very end or some other uh, longevity protection. So I would actually suggest that it would start as in the market and in competition, but much as automatic enrollment uh, rapidly overtook the rest of the uh, methods to uh, start to save and invest, that I believe that... One of the problems that people face when they have a lot of choices is that they freeze. They do nothing. This way, they are at least moved into something that provides them with an income vehicle. And it also allows those, whether it's 7 or 700 or 7 million, who actually do the research to find something else that is more optimal to them, then they have the ability to move into that. They're not locked into one solution as they would be with an annuity product. So I believe that this will take the same course that automatic enrollment will take, that people will see, oh, good, there's the decision. I don't have to worry about this anymore. Uh, I can look at other things. And then as their circumstances change, they may move into one of the other products that are available. Can I comment on that as well? I, I would just say with respect to employers, 
I think they would want uh, safe harbor with respect to the selection of that provider. I think that would be really important. And if that's not clear, they're not likely to do it. And, you know, outside of an ERISA context, maybe in a public plan environment, there might even be more flexibility to think about it and pursue it with more urgency. Uh, we have a lot of questions and uh, no more time for this session. But we're gonna, we will get the other group up there after the next session and feel free to ask questions for this session or the next session uh, in the other session. Let me thank all of you for wonderful uh, presentations and the, dis the, the discussion. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.